in the name of uh, the Argentina Petroleum section of the SPE, we want to thank you, John, for uh, giving us the opportunity to listen to your lecture today. It's a real honor for us to have you as, as a distinguished uh, speaker. And uh, we are going to present to you virtually at this time, but we are going to mail it later to you, a certificate of uh, recognition for this kind attitude. So let's go ahead and I'll present the certificate to John and uh, I'm going to change the, the mic to Pablo again to start with the presentations. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. It's, uh, um, uh, well, welcome. Uh, I am Juan Pablo Barrer, and on behalf of the conference committee of the SPA of the Argentine section, it's an immense honor and pleasure to present this webinar entitled, What Would Arp Think About What We Have Done to His Decline Model? of the celebrity lecturer, John Lee. This conference program promotes the SPE's mission to collect, disseminate, and exchange technical knowledge, as, as well as to provide opportunities for professionals to improve their technical skills. The SPE thanks the companies and organizations that allow their professionals to serve as lecturers, in this case, Texas AM University. We also thank the sponsor of this cycle of conferences of the Argentine section of the SPE. In the gold category, to Pan American Energy, Plus Petrol, and Shell. In the silver category, to Pampa Energia, Tech Petrol, YPF, and Equinor. And in the bronze category, to Halliburton and Industrias, Juan F. Seco. We take this opportunity to mention the next conferences of our SPE section. With besides excellent distinguished lecturers, the virtual presence of two celebrities, Tom Blysingham and Mark Sobak. In each opportunity, these seminars will be publicized through the website of the Argentine SPE, as well as on LinkedIn, Instagram, and social networks. On September 12th, we are going to have the DL lecturer, Martin Story, and the, uh, he's going to, to present a survival guide for digital transformation. On October 13, we are going to have Thomas A. Blessingham, and he, he's going to present PTA, RTA, DCA methods for the evaluation of well performance in unconventional reservoirs. In November 3, the 3rd, we're going to have in person the DL Chandramani Srivastava, and he's going to present the fractured challenge, what can we resolve while drilling? And on December 1st, we're going to have uh, Mark Sobak, and he's going to present geomechanical processes affecting optimization of multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. It should also be noted that additional four members of the SPE are available and, until May uh, 23, 10 free virtual conferences of DL lect of distinguished lecturers accessible from the SPE webpage. Uh, it is highlighted that among the main benefits for the members of the SPE are access to the industry's largest collection of technical knowledge, including the following online publications. The flagship publication of the SPE, Journal of Petroleum Technology, One Petro, with approximately 200,000 technical papers. It is the definitive online library. Oil and gas facilities dedicated to facilities, construction, production, and operations. PetroWiki, it's an open source platform for sharing knowledge. Data science and digital engineering with a focus on the evolution of data management and use in the industry. HSE now focuses on aspects of health, safety, protection, and environment. SPE Energy Stream 
to watch through online videos, opinion leaders, experts in the different specialties, and leading companies share their perspective and technical solutions. Also, we have at the SPE networking opportunities through global, regional, and local events, and professional development through in-person and online training courses, competency management tool, and petroleum engineering certification, among others. Also, we have uh, awards and recognitions. Some comments received on the SPE. SPE is like the soul of the body of petroleum engineering. It's from Bahadur Mahafiasar of the Trendhelm section from Norway. SPE keeps me up to date on emerging ideas and techniques from Meredith Miranda of the Gulf of Mexico section. In the coming days, you will receive an email with the link to access the video and presentation of today's lecture on the website of the Argentine section of the SPE. You can ask your questions in the chat of this webinar or asking to open your microphone in the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. I leave you with Pablo Crespo, Crespo who will be the moderator of this conference. Please, Pablo, go ahead. OK, thanks, everybody, for joining us. First of all, I will introduce the abstract of this presentation. One of the most important issues that operators in resources place, such as Bacamuerta, have to deal with is forecasting. And the ARF hyperbolic decline model introduced in 1944 remains a common method for this forecasting. We will take a close look at ARPET ARF's decline model to see if the methodology he recommended for early vertical wells almost 80 years ago still applies to modern horizontal wells with, with multiple frag stages. Uh, a short bi biography of uh, Sean Lee is, Sean holds the DBG Endowed Chair in Petroleum Engineering at Texas A&M University. He holds a Bachelor of Science, a Master of Science, and a PhD degree in Chemical Engineering from Georgia Tech. Sean worked for ExxonMobil early in his career and specialized in integrated reservoir studies. He has taught at Mississippi State University, the University of Houston, and Texas A&M. He also served as a consultant with Holditch and Associates, where he specialized in reservoir engineering aspects of unconventional gas resources. He served as an academic engineering fellow with the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission in Washington during 2007 and 2008 to help modernize rules for reporting oil and gas reserves, including the uh, yeah, commission. And Shoni uh, is the author of four textbooks published by SPE and has received numerous awards from SPE, including the Lucas Medal, the De Gaulier Distinguished Service Medal, and Honorary Membership. He is also a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. Just a brief comment, uh, as Juan Pablo mentioned before, at the end of the presentation, hopefully we will have a few minutes for Q&A &Q uh, section. So I strongly recommend that you send the questions uh, to the chat during the presentation so we could recall them at the end of the presentation. So, having introduced the presentation, Sean, is uh, all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, thank all of you for attending this presentation. I hope you find some ideas of interest. Uh, I certainly have been looking forward to this for several weeks now, and I understand that we have a very large international audience from many countries, which makes it doubly an honor to be with you here today. Uh, let me see if I can make my slides available to you. Uh, let's see what we have here. Well, that's not quite the right file. Uh, please bear it's with showing, me. It's showing fine. 
Yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to find the slides. which I had open a moment ago. Uh, well, bear with me. Here is my presentation. Uh, is this being shared? Can you see my slides? Not, Not at this moment, but it was showing a few minutes ago. Yeah. Let me... Uh, let me try again to share it. Okay. Well, please forgive me. Try to find this file again. Okay, the files are definitely here. Uh, I'm having difficulty in getting them showing. Um, let me try this. Okay, now back, and let's see now what, yeah. okay, here. There it is. Okay. Now you see it? Yes. Okay. We can see it now. It's not in presentation mode, but uh, you can put it in presentation mode. Yeah. Now you see it full screen, correct? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Pardon the delay. Uh, all right. So, what we're going to talk about today is this question What would ARP think about what we have done to his decline model? And to start with, let's make sure we all have the same understanding about this question. What is the ARPS decline model? Well, ARPS presented several different models which can be used to fit production data, production histories, and then use that fit to forecast future production. Of those models, the one that's going to be our focus today, because it's the most general and the most widely applicable, is ARP's so-called hyperbolic decline model. It fits a production history which has the shape of a hyperbola on the usual way of plotting. And this is ARP's 
hyperbolic decline model, which I will assume many of you are familiar with. The basic model says that the rate from a well at any time t is equal to the initial rate, that is the rate at time zero, divided by one plus a parameter b, shown here in red, times the initial decline rate, times the elapsed time t. And that group is raised to the power one over b. And ARP said that parameter b should be between zero and one. So how did ARPS come up with this particular model? Well, he, he me, really worked me, John, backward. Uh, from, we are still seeing your your uh, first slide. Uh, you oh, should not put, it in, put it in presentation mode and uh, so you can change the slides. Well, All right, I'm in uh, presentation mode. Do you see that or you see full screen? No, we, we don't see full screen, uh, full screen. We, 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 uh, you can touch the screen at the bottom of the slide and it will show it at full screen. Yep, that's not what we wanted. Or you may you may change the slides by just uh, pressing the arrows. Yeah, I can change the slides. I, I would like for you to be able to see it. Okay. Full screen, but we'll do what we can. Let me get the laser pointer. And uh, okay, let me let me back up again. Sorry for the delay. Uh, Here's the ARPS model again. Can you see it now? No, we are stuck on the first uh, on the first slide. Oh me. Let me try to share again and find another way so that you can see everything. Or right, here's the presentation that I want. Let me try again to share my screen with you. Definitely don't want this. All right, excuse the delay. I'm gonna have John, to do... John, if you want, I I I, I have the, your presentation. I, I don't know if if you have any change changes, but I can share uh, the the presentation that that I have from from you. I don't know if is that okay with you or yeah that's okay uh, I don't want to waste any more of your time so let's let me just let you show the slides and I'll tell you when to change okay but let me um, let me go back to okay where I can see you 
Okay. Uh, this is the first slide, John. Are, are, are you seeing that? Are you watching? Uh, yeah, this is the first slide past the title slide. Is, is this a slide with the title, what is the ARPS decline model? Are you projecting that? Yeah. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's look at this. Let me repeat myself. You know, we're going to be talking about the ARPS decline model. And uh, uh, the most important model that he proposed is the hyperbolic model, which I show on the slide, tells us rate is a function of time, and it's a function of a parameter B, uh, initial decline rate D sub I, and elapsed time. And ARP said that this parameter B is between zero and one. Okay, can you show the next slide, please? Yeah. All right, so the next question is, how did ARPS come up with this model? And the answer is, it's important. Uh, he really worked backward from two definitions. The first definition is a standard definition of decline rate for a well in its production history. And that definition uh, is the decline rate is the change in rate with time divided by the rate. And it has a negative sign because rate is going to be decreasing with time. And that gives us a positive value for decline rate. That's the same as the change in the logarithm of rate with time, if you want to consider it that way. OK, that's, that's one definition. And then there's a second one. ARPS defined a parameter B, and he defined that as the change in the reciprocal of rate, one over decline rate, which he called the loss ratio. And so B is defined as that change in reciprocal of loss ratio with time. Now here we come to an extremely important empirical observation that ARPS made. And that is for most wells that ARPS and a colleague named Cutler analyzed, he found that this parameter B defined in this way was constant. It didn't change with time. That includes the special case when B is equal to zero but he found that B simply remained constant throughout the history of the well. Right. Given that observation, I've said, okay, let's, I don't necessarily know why, but I have observed in nature that B is constant. Therefore, I will integrate this equation given the assumption that B is constant and I'll solve it for decline rate D as a function of time. He did that. So now he had a decline rate D as a function of time and going to the top equation, we substitute that and then solve the equation for rate as a function of time. And in going through that process, could we see the next slide? Uh, when he integrated in this in this fashion, that's what led to the hyperbolic decline model. So many who have not looked at where this came from have assumed that perhaps this is simply an, an empirical equation which proves in practice to provide a good fit to available data. But really, there's much more to it than that. Uh, it's 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 really fundamentally based on certain definitions and then the empirical observation that B is constant. So uh, 
given that integration for constant B, that's what leads to the arcs decline model. Now that has a, that has a significant implication. And the implication is that arcs hyperbolic decline equation is valid only in situations in which B is constant. Again, remember, he had to assume that to develop the model. So that has to be true or the model arguably might not be relevant at all, might not be appropriate. Now this particular model, this hyperbolic model has been thoroughly validated. There have been decades of successful application. People have applied the model to production data and on the basis of the fit that they found, uh, the parameters in the model that they found, the parameters B, DI and QI, they've made production forecasts and those forecasts have proved to be pretty good forecast. What we know now is through these decades of successful application uh, that the assumption that B is constant is valid, but we also know now that the physical requirement for B to be constant is that the well must be in boundary dominated flow which I've abbreviated here as BDF. And that means that the well must be draining its full drainage area. We can't be in a transient period where we're draining only part of that drainage area and that that drainage area is increasing with time. Our equation in its original form requires that we be draining the full associated drainage area. Let's go to the next slide. So the next question that we need to address is this, why should anyone trust this particular model that ARCS has come up with? Well, for one thing, ARPS and really uh, my slide has disappeared. Can everyone still see it? Everyone other than me? I can no longer see it on my monitor. Uh, uh, John, everything is okay? You're not seeing the, the I slides? I don't see the slides anymore. Can you see, Sorry. can you see this? Uh, with me sharing my screen? Yeah, perfect, yeah. Okay, all right. That's Okay, then I'll start moving my own slides then. Hope, hope, hope okay. so they move. Let's, let's see if that happens. Okay, I don't see the slide advance. I don't know that we've done a whole lot of good. Okay, is the slide advancing? In your yeah, view? perfect. All right, good, good. Okay. Good. All yeah. right. All right. Again, we're addressing the question now, why should anyone trust this model? Well, ARPS, and, 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 well, my screen went blank again. I don't know what's wrong. Uh, it has disappeared. Let's see if I can get it back. We're just, we're simply having transmission difficulties. That's unfortunate. We'll get there. All right, let me try again to share. Uh, 
Okay. I can see the slide again. Can you see it? Are we communicating? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, John. Uh, we are seeing the, the slide. Why should anyone trust the model? It's okay. Perfect. Yeah, it's, it's okay. I'm not sure I can advance it readily, but uh, uh, we see that slide. Uh, again, ARPS and those that worked with him found that the slide led to correct conclusions. First, it seemed to fit most rate time data well. So looks like it has the proper form. Secondly, it led to reasonable forecasts of future production. And then finally, it rests on the well-established empirical observation that that parameter B is in fact constant when a well is in boundary dominated flow. So what does this model require then to be appropriate? We, we, you know, we found by application in the industry that the model is appropriate, but what are the, what are the requirements for the model really to be appropriate? What are the circumstances under which uh, we expect this to work? Well, first, we find that for this B to be constant and therefore the model to be appropriate, we must have production at constant bottom hole pressure. It's not going to work when the bottom hole pressure is changing with time. Secondly, the well or the reservoir must be in boundary dominated flow, sometimes called pseudo steady state flow, but that's really not the best terminology. I'm going to call it boundary dominated flow again. That's the flow regime that we have once the well has begun to drain the entire drainage area that it's associated with. And now we might say we might have a potential problem in taking this 80 year old model that ARPS worked with and bringing it to today because if the well must be in boundary dominated flow. This means we have no guarantees that this model will work with transient flow data, with data obtained while the drainage area of the well is growing uh, prior to beginning to uh, drain the entire area associated with the well. We'll come back to that later. Uh, this is an apparent problem, but it turns out to be something that we can drill, uh, deal with. Another requirement we find these 80 years later is that the well has to have a constant or unchanging productivity index. This means no change in damage or stimulation. So if say we refracture a well, well, that's going to cause that's a that's a change in stimulation. We're going to have to uh, start over in our attempt to match production history and find matching parameters in the model. Uh, said another way, the skin factor, which is a quantitative measure of damage or stimulation in a well, that skin factor must be constant, not changing with time. And the drainage area of the well, if we have to be in boundary dominated flow, the drainage area of the well has to be fixed, unchanging. Well, it turns out we find with more analysis that for stabilized flow, that is when we're in boundary dominated flow and when there is no change in the productivity index with time, when bottom hole pressure is constant, we find that the drainage uh, uh, the dra and when the drainage area is unchanging under these circumstances, we find that that's sufficient to allow B to be constant for the life of the well, which is what ARPS assumed was the case in the first place to develop his model. But we have a lot of conditions that we have to satisfy here. 
All right, so ARPS established his model, and it turns out that those conditions that I just outlined were in fact uh, the conditions of the wells that he analyzed. Now, the data that are analyzed in establishing his model, they came from wells that had begun to produce in the 1920s, 1930s, and even early 1940s. The paper in which he presented his model was presented in 1944 and actually published in SPE literature in 1945. Now here's some facts about those wells. They were all vertical wells. Of course, that's all we had at that time. Importantly, none of those wells had been stimulated with a hydraulic fracture. In fact, the first commercial fracture stimulation occurred in 1947. And that was a fracture treatment which was conducted by Halliburton for a company, Amico, which later uh, was acquired by BP. Prior to that, and certainly at the time that the data that were gathered from which ARPS developed his model, they were not fractured. They, uh, they were producing with very little stimulation. The kind of stimulation that was available at that time was at best acidization, uh, or there was, there was a lot of, or there was some stimulation uh, generated by exploding nitroglycerin in the well bore, uh, which would remove some near well bore formation damage by just shattering that rock near the well bore, but no fractures, and so no really effective stimulation of the reservoir. Now, the reason that I go through this is uh, but because what this means is that for a well to have been commercial in that era, it had to have a, what we'll call a conventional level of permeability. The permeability had to be in the range of tens to hundreds of millidarsies. It couldn't have been a low permeability well because it wouldn't have been commercial. And again, it couldn't have been stimulated because hydraulic fracturing technology simply did not exist. Now, why does the value of permeability matter in whether or not a well is in boundary dominated flow? Well, it, we can show that the time required in a vertical well for the well to reach boundary dominated flow, it can be estimated from this expression, which really comes from the theory of depth of investigation or uh, depth of drainage in a formation, which is widely published. It's in, it's in my books. But what we find there is the time required to reach boundary dominated flow is equal to a numerical constant, which depends on the units that we use for our quantities, times porosity, fluid viscosity, total system compressibility, the drainage radius of the well, and importantly, the permeability in the reservoir that we're draining. Now for a 10 millidarsi gas reservoir, as an example, that's a conventional level of permeability. If we substitute representative values for the parameters in this equation, we find that the time required to reach boundary dominated flow is about five days for a gas well on 160 acre spacing. Only five days required. So we reach boundary dominated flow very quickly with that conventional level of permeability. In today's world, in our unconventional resources, we're looking at permeabilities in the nano Darcy range. For example, in the first important shale play, 
and the Barnett Shale, a representative value of permeability there is 100 nanodarcies. And for representative reservoir properties in the Barnett Shale, the time required to reach boundary dominated flow in a vertical well on 160 acre spacing is 240 years, which means that in that vertical well with that wide of spacing, we would never reach boundary dominated flow. So the important point here is that in Arp's time, in the time in which he gathered his data to develop and validate his model, he was looking at situations with conventional level permeabilities of tens, hundreds of milliDarcies, in which wells reached boundary dominated flow uh, almost always within the first month that they were producing. But that's not happening anymore. At least it wouldn't be happening if we were drilling vertical wells and had very wide spacing. So we have to say ARP's world and our world are quite different. Now, what's, what's the cause of boundary dominated flow in uh, different kinds of reservoirs? We need to take a quick look at that. And I've taken a diagram here from this particular SPE paper, uh, which you may choose to review, uh, to try to illustrate uh, what causes a well to finally enter the boundary dominated flow regime. Uh, in this simple example reservoir that we show here on the left, we have a small reservoir. The uh, reservoir boundaries are shown here with the darker or thicker gold line. So it's a small reservoir. Let's suppose there are three vertical wells in it. All right, if we start producing these wells and continue to produce them until the, the flow stabilizes, that is until we reach boundary dominated flow and have begun to drain the entire drainage area associated with these wells, what we'll find is that about halfway in between each pair of wells, we will find a no flow boundary, but it's not a zero permeability rock boundary like a outer boundary. Instead, it's an, it's an artificial boundary. It's an imaginary line in that reservoir, which is roughly halfway in between these wells. In other words, all the fluid on the upper side of the line flows toward the upper well all the fluid on the lower side of the line flows toward the lower well. Same thing is true for the two upper wells. There will be a no flow boundary that will develop in between these wells. And for the two wells on the right, again, a no flow boundary will appear between these wells. So these wells will all reach boundary dominated flow, but those flow boundaries are caused mostly by interference between these wells. Well, let's look over here on the, at the diagram on the right, and we show here uh, now a horizontal well uh, with multiple fractures. The fractures in that horizontal well are shown with the dotted blue lines. All right, with the horizontal well, what happens as we begin to produce this horizontal well with the, with the multiple stages of fractures, the first fluid that's produced is going to come from the matrix and flow in toward these fractures. So it'll be fluid near the fractures that will be flowing in. We'll begin to drain further and further out with time. And eventually we'll reach the point where uh, we get interference between adjacent fractures. And that point at which interference occurs, in the case of our horizontal well with multiple fractures, that's now our no-flow boundary, that point roughly halfway in between these wells. 
And once we have begun to drain out like that and have reached fracture interference, we have now entered the boundary dominated flow regime. I have a, another figure which illustrates this, I think somewhat more clearly than what I was able to do for the fractured well in the previous diagram. Here again, we show adjacent fractures. As we begin to produce the well, we drain the fluid nearest the fracture uh, that comes from the matrix into the fracture. We drain further and further out with time. And about halfway in between adjacent fractures, uh, we'll establish a no-flow boundary. In other words, these, these fractures have interfered with one another. Now, this is, you know, the drainage area in between the fractures is much less than this large number that I cited earlier for vertical wells uh, with typical well spacing that we have in conventional level permeabilities. Uh, and, and we have to come up with this much closer spacing between fractures and much smaller drainage areas for each stage of the fractures in order to establish boundary dominated flow in a reasonable period of time. It still turns out that even with close fracture stage spacing, the time required to reach boundary dominated flow still can be in the range of months or in some cases, maybe even years before we get this boundary dominated flow. And again, I will remind you, we must get the boundary dominated flow for uh, the ARPS model to be considered to be appropriate. So that raises another question. Can ARPS hyperbolic model work for modern wells in low permeability reservoirs, or it may take months or years to reach boundary dominated flow. So applying ARPS model and resource plays, can we expect it to work? Well, the short answer to that question is yes, the model does work. How can this be so? If we, if Art said, we have to be in boundary dominated flow, well, what we can do, we can take the flow history for a well and we divide it into multiple segments and we apply ARPS models separately to each segment. Now, the first major segment that we will see is the transient flow segment or the well is in the transient flow regime. The drainage area of the well is still growing with time. This is often near, near linear flow, a early linear flow regime, linear flow from the matrix into the fractures as illustrated on this previous uh, plot that I showed you. That will be followed by boundary dominated flow. And that's the region in which ARPS validated his model. Uh, in our horizontal wells, we reach boundary dominated flow when we get interference between adjacent fractures. But it's boundary dominated flow. ARPS validated his model in boundary dominated flow. And we find in practice that the ARPS model is appropriate in boundary dominated flow. Now, to be complete, there is a transition region in between transient flow when the drainage area is growing and boundary dominated flow when we've had complete fracture interference. We don't instantaneously go from transient flow to boundary dominated flow, there is that transition region, but uh, it's, it's relatively shorter than the boundary dominated flow region for sure. Uh, for completeness, I also want to point out that 
in, uh, in our analysis of production data, there's really a fourth different flow regime. It's almost always there. And that's at very early times, uh, we have some data which really turn out to be off trend uh, and the well is will be increasing in production it starts at a at a, a lower rate the rate increases uh, because we usually start off with the well choke back we don't impose the full possible drawdown on the well uh, at first because that might cause damage to the permeability within the prop fracture or maybe even damage the permeability within the matrix itself so we come up to the flow on trend with this early ramp up period that arguably is a fourth flow regime. So we have the potential here for four flow regimes in our much more complicated modern wells, horizontal wells with multi-stage fractures. Well, this complicates life for us with these, with these different possible segments so that raises the question, how can we identify these separate segments? Well, the answer to that question is we identify these different segments with log log plots of rate versus time. And uh, we can be assisted if we not only plot rate versus time, but we plot rate versus what we call material balance time. Now material balance time, that's cumulative production divided by rate. All right, this diagram that I show here is a diagram uh, which shows a modern version of uh, a fairly well-known type curve called the Fetkovich type curve. I'm not going to go into the details of that Fetkovich type curve, but what I want to show in this diagram, it's basically a log log plot of rate versus time and the various stems on this plot uh, are stems on which actual field data can fall, uh, different stems for different wells. The point that I want to emphasize here is that uh, on this sort of plot, uh, we see straight lines in a number of cases. Uh, for example, during the earliest times, it's called dimensionless time here, but uh, on an actual rate versus actual time plot at earliest times, in these horizontal wells with multiple fractures, uh, we will usually see a straight line. That indicates transient linear flow. And later, once we reach boundary dominated flow, we see curves that look like this. And in some cases at later times, uh, the parameter here is the ARPS B factor. Sometimes at later times, again, we will see straight lines. Now, I'm mentioning these straight lines because it turns out that if we can see a straight line on these log log plots of rate versus time, the slopes of those straight lines turn out to be the reciprocal of the ARPS B factor. It turns out that the ARPS model is working both, and it's appropriate in both the transient flow regime, even before we have begun to drain the entire drainage area, as long as we see the straight line, it turns out that the slope of that straight line is related to the ARPS B factor. And then after we get to boundary dominated flow, which on this part, plot uh, begins to occur at about this time here. After that, we're in boundary dominated flow. And once we're in boundary dominated flow, uh, 
we can find the arch B factor. In fact, we can find it even before the line becomes straight during boundary dominated flow. These curves here are curves for different values of arcs parameter B, ranging from 0, 0, 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. And so when we ask the question, does actual data fall on a straight line? The answer is sometimes yes. For example, in our horizontal wells of multiple fractures, we're very likely to see an early time linear flow with a B value of two. Now, the B value doesn't have to be two. There are other wells for which we can call the flow regime instead of linear flow, just power law. And the definition of power law flow is flow in which the rate versus time data fall on a straight line. And so we may have linear flow with a straight line like this with B of two, but we can have other straight lines with other values of B. The important point is we can see these straight lines. What about in boundary dominated flow? Well, when B is large, when it's in the range of 0.6 to 0.8, you can see on this graph, which include, you know, th this is really just a plot of arcs, hyperbolic decline equation, a log log scale, and you can see that eventually we do have straight lines. And so when we see those straight lines, you know, we can readily find the B value. But in some cases in boundary dominated flow, we don't ever really get to a straight line when B is small, like when B is zero, for example, for what we call exponential decline, that curve is bending continuously so we can't count on seeing a straight line what we have to do there is just fit the data using regression analysis that's what commercial decline curve analysis software allows us to do it applies regression analysis to the production time data and it finds the arcs parameters that give us a bit best fit to the data but that is possible wells in boundary dominated flow. So in summary, what I'm going to say here is that not only can we find the B factors once we're in boundary dominated flow, and we can find that the arcs hyperbolic model works in boundary dominated flow, even when we have, even when we have multiple flow regimes, but when we have straight lines during the earlier transient flow regime, before we begin to drain the entire drainage area, if we can see straight lines, we can also find the arcs B factor in that case too. It, it works there also, we find in practice. All right, now, up to now, with what I've showed you, it's, it's more or less theoretical, hypothetical, analytical solutions to flow equations like on that type curve that I just showed you. So the important question now is, okay, that's that's wonderful for all these theoretical cases, but what does actual field data look like? Well, here I show you an actual field case. This is a log log plot again of rate versus time. Now, it's, it's, it's been obscured a little bit with this particular software that I use to analyze these data. What we've plotted is rate divided by the maximum rate ever observed in the well, so that on this rate scale, it never gets above one. But again, that's just sort of, that's a rate normalized for maximum rate. That's plotted on this graph. Uh, versus actual elapsed time and the plot versus actual elapsed time that's shown with the open blue circles. There's noise in this data. There's always noise in the data. Nevertheless, we see we can fit these data very well with a straight line. And in fact, this straight line has a slope of one half and that's characteristic of 
transient flow. These data are from a horizontal well in the Barnett Shale. And what we see is the data fall on a straight line and they stay on a straight line up to a time of about 2,300 days, which uh, you can kind of interpolate mentally here. This is about 2,300 days. 2,300 days, that's five or six years of transient flow for this well, but we can find the ARPS B factor. And so we can use the ARPS hyperbolic model to fit uh, these early data, as in this case. We also have a plot here with the black dots of rate versus material balance time. A few slides back, I defined material balance time for you as cumulative production divided by rate. We see that eventually these data also fall on a straight line, also with a slope of one half. It's offset a bit from the plot of rate versus actual time, but we do see the half slope line. Now, the reason for also including this plot of rate versus material balance time is that when we get to boundary dominated flow on a log log plot of rate versus material balance time, the data will begin to fall on a straight line with a, with a slope of unity. And when we get to that slope of unity, that means we are fully in the boundary dominated flow regime where ARPS established many years ago that his hyperbolic decline model works. And it works here. Uh, we are in boundary dominated flow. The ARPS hyperbolic decline model is appropriate. But now we know it also works earlier when we are in transient flow. And that's a very important finding. Now, do we always see boundary dominated flow in our actual field data? No, we do not. Here's another example of a well from a, another shale formation. Again, a plot of rate versus actual time and a plot of rate versus material balance time. All right, the plot versus actual time, the open blue circles, those data fall on a trend that can be fit very well by a straight line. Again, the slope of that line is one half and a slope of one half that corresponds to an arcs B of two. But this is all transient flow because on the material balance time plot, you see that all the data fall on this half slope line and we, we don't see a transition toward and we definitely don't see a movement toward that unit slope line, which is the characteristic signature of boundary dominated flow. So in this case, all we see is transient flow, no influence by the boundaries here uh, in this particular case. That's yet to occur in the future. But even for the transient flow, uh, we do find that the ARPS model is appropriate for analyzing the data. The B value is, turns out to be the reciprocal of the slope on a log log plot. The slope in this case is minus one half. That is, we go over two log cycles every time we come down one log cycle. That slope is minus one half. B turns out to be the reciprocal of that slope. B is two when the slope is one half. And what I've really just described is a simple way that we can use to determine B, which is particularly useful for transient flow. Let's consider ARPS hyperbolic model. Here it is. Now, let's suppose the group B, D, I, T, suppose that group is greater than one. Here it is in our equation. It doesn't take long for that group to be large compared to one, so we can neglect the one. All right, if, if we then take the logarithm of both sides of this equation, 
we find that the log of rate is equal to the log of initial rate, QI, minus, when we take logarithms, this becomes minus one over B times the log of this group, B DI times T. We can simplify what we have in this log term, and this just becomes a constant minus one over B times the log of time. In other words, we can break this log term into log of B DI plus log of T, all multiplied by minus one over B. But what we found here is that uh, the ARPS hyperbolic model reduces to this very simple equation, log rate is equal to a constant minus one over B times the log of time. Now, on a log-log plot then, the slope of a rate versus time plot is just minus one over B. So if B is, well, if the slope is minus one half, as theory predicts it will be in transient linear flow, then B is just the reciprocal of that slope. And therefore, that's the reason why on the previous slide I said, okay, we see a slope of minus one half here, therefore B is two. It's easy to find what the arch B factor is on a log log plot, even for data and transient flow. But we're not quite done yet. We still have the issue, the important issue, of using the ARPS model to forecast future production. How can we forecast with a multi-segment ARPS model? Well, when we have some data that have reached boundary-dominated flow, as is the case in this particular example, uh, we found on our log log plot that we that we get some data in boundary dominated flow. Let's say that occurs at a time uh, equivalent, you know, a time shown by this uh, vertical red line. Let's suppose we find on our diagnostic on our diagnostic plot that before that time we had transient flow, but after that time we're in boundary dominated flow. How can we? then forecast if we have these two different segments in the history of the well? Well, the answer is if we have reached boundary dominated flow, we just fit those data with the ARPS model. We can do this with our conventional forecast if we choose, but we fit the data with our conventional ARPS model. We find the B and DI and QI for the data in this region, we find the parameters in the ARPS model, and then we can just tell our software, okay, use those parameters to forecast future production from that well, and that's what we've done here. Now, notice our forecast is this red line, and that's our fit of the later data, the data in boundary dominated flow. Notice that that fit is not a fit of the early data. It doesn't fit the transient flow data. But we don't care. Transient flow is over with and gone. And we're trying to forecast the future. And we need to do that forecast by working with data in boundary dominated flow. Find the ARPS parameters there, extrapolate those into the future, and thus come up with a a good forecast in which we can have confidence for a well that first had transient flow and had the transient flow regime and then follows that by boundary dominated flow. Now, that technique is perfectly sound and workable. I do want to point out one assumption that we've made if we do this, and that is that if there is interference between this well and offset wells, which occurs later, that will tend to change the trend and make the, make the decline a bit steeper once we get that interference. So we have to be careful about interference. Doing that is really beyond the scope of what I can cover.
in this particular presentation, but I do want to remind you of that limitation. Bottom line, even though we have multiple segments, we can do our forecasting with that multi-segment ARPS model. We need to find that boundary dominated flow regime and extrapolate it into the future. But suppose we have a situation where we have only transient flow in all our data. Our diagnostic plot, that log log rate versus time plot, has indicated that we have only transient flow. What do we do then? Well, if we have only transient flow, what we have to do, we have to switch from our transient model to a boundary dominated flow model. Uh, and we're going to have to tell our software the decline rate at which we should switch. And then we will switch to our boundary dominated flow model with some specified minimum decline rate at which we switch. Uh, and we have to tell the software what the B value will be in our boundary dominated flow model. Now, I know that many, perhaps a majority of people, will say, well, if we have to switch from a production history, which is all transient flow, and if, and if we have to switch uh, to boundary dominated flow, uh, let's switch to a, a B factor and boundary dominated flow equals zero. That's what many do. That's called the modified ARPS method. And you can tell software to do that. But B doesn't have to be zero in boundary dominated flow. B can still be any of those values that uh, appeared in the ARPS model, anything between zero and one. And on that type curve that I showed you several slides back, you notice that on that type curve, uh, which basically is projecting what production profiles might look like after we get to boundary dominated flow. Uh, those curves are available for B, anything from zero to some other value. It, you are free to choose what B value you think will be appropriate in boundary dominated flow. It doesn't have to be zero, but many use zero. And if that's what you prefer to do, that's fine. That's up to you. This decline rate at which you switch, if all you have is transient flow, how do you know when to switch? Like on this diagram, these data are all in transient flow and we switched somewhere along about here. Uh, if we had continued to forecast with transient flow, this is what the profile would have looked like, but we switched at this point and this is our forecast, including the switch. You have to tell your software when to switch. The, the decline rate at which to switch, that best comes from analogy. Other wells in the same area, which have reached boundary dominated flow, you have to study those histories and say, looks like in this area of this reservoir, we need to switch when the decline rate reaches 10%, 15%, whatever the number is. And so you can determine that switch decline rate from analogy. You can also determine it from uh, more rigorous reservoir simulation modeling. But you have to tell the software when to switch. All right, this really has put together all the fundamentals that I wanted to mention. But remember that the question that I asked as the title of this presentation, what would ARPS think about this procedure? Remember in ARPS day, everything or most all wells went through a single segment decline. ARPS was able to fit all the data with this hyperbolic decline model. He was able to fit all the data and got the production data, did some sort of regression analysis, fit the data. Once he fit it and had the parameters in the model, he could then use those to forecast future production. We can't do that today. 
But I think we have good reason to believe that ARPS would approve of our multi-segment approach to fitting and forecasting data. Because what we see that we have to do now is first use a procedure that honors the fact that we're going to have an early ramp up period while bottom hole pressure is coming down to its terminal value. Arch pointed out in his paper that he observed that ramp up period. What I've suggested that we do honors the hyperbolic decline model that he proposed and advocated. And we, our, our suggested procedure honors that hyperbolic decline model during boundary dominated flow, just like just like ARP suggested. What we've done, we've added the transient flow regime in our analysis work, which is going to be there in our modern low permeability wells. And as I've tried to illustrate in my presentation, when our data lie on a straight line, on a log log plot, the ARP hyperbolic model is still appropriate. B is constant as long as the data fall on a straight line on that log log plot. Now B will be greater than one for transient data. But that B greater than one, remember, that doesn't last for the life of the well. Many analysts argue that B should not be greater than one because if you use that, and, ex and extrapolate and forecast with a big gray one for the life of the well, you're likely to end up vo uh, violating some laws of physics. You're likely to end up predicting more recovery from a well than there's hydrocarbon in place in the drain of that well, violating the law of physics, namely conservation of mass. But you see, we're not doing that. We're just using a B greater than one for the transient region and then we're switching and much of our forecast period is during boundary dominated flow with a B less than one, just as ARPS advocated and found. Now, we can, in our modern approach, include yet another flow regime, a transition flow regime. It, you will find that in that transition between transient flow and boundary dominated flow that the arcs B factor will vary continuously with time. But as a good approximation, if you want to use a three segment arcs model, you can just use a, a, a constant B as a, an approximate but adequate fit, maybe from an analog, use that as a for first approximation. But with this procedure, you can make the arcs hyperbolic model work for you. You can come up with Good forecast, and in my opinion, if ARPS were alive today and saw what we're doing now, in my opinion, I think he would agree that this is a sound procedure which can lead to good forecasts in which we can have confidence. And so with that, I will conclude my presentation and I'll be happy at this point answer any questions that you might have. And I certainly, I thank you for, for your attention to this presentation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, so now we can open uh, the Q&A uh, section. We have a, a question from Ruth Totorica. And the question is, at what point in the future would be proper to switch to boundary dominated flow with no previous well in the area for short production history. Any difference between gas and oil? John? Juan, vos escuchás, ¿no? Por las dudas. Sí. 
Ahí está, estás muteado, Juan. Sí, sí. Eh... Ok, I've rejoined the presentation. Can you, can you hear me and see me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. All right. So, uh, this is, I, I gave the same presentation at the Writer Scout Conference. That's why you see this title slide. I could never recover uh, the revised version that I had with this presentation. So, forgive me for that. But this, this is the same presentation. Uh, let me, let me answer. The, the, the audio is very noisy. You cannot see the sound? Okay, but hopefully you can see me now. And so, uh, if you have questions, let's see if I can answer your questions without having to refer to those slides that I'm having such trouble with. Do you have questions about my presentation? Uh, okay. 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 Yeah. Here's a comment. No question. Yeah, we have a question from Julie Okay, so as I understood the question it was if in the production in the, in the area that we're investigating we don't have any wells that have reached boundary dominated flow uh, which we would like to have because uh, with those all of wells we could find the decline rate at which we need to switch from the transit flow chain to the boundary dominated flow chain. But if we don't have any else, the question is, what can we do? Well, then we would prefer to try to find some analog wells somewhere, as close to analog as we could find. Absent that, what we would have to do is use reservoir simulation, come up with as best ways that we can find for the properties of the reservoir and simply with a reservoir simulator, simulate the production profile of those properties and find from that simulated profile the time at which we reach down the downward flow and find from that simulated profile what the decline rate is at the time we reach that boundary downward flow regime. So we would have to do it simulation. But again, I would much prefer to try to find some analog wells and find some actual performance in the field when we reach boundary down the mode flow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Maria. Does ARPS considerations and if so, what about the possibility of changing the uh, If we have a change in bottom hole pressure uh, and we don't take it into account, then our, our analysis is going to be incorrect. Uh, we, do, we do the best we can with it, you know, but we need to recognize we shouldn't have as much confidence in our forecast. If the bottom of the pressure is decreasing, and that's usually the kind of situation that we get into, that makes the, the slope of our rate versus time curve 
a little bit less steep than it really should be. That change of bone pressure tends to prop up the rate. Uh, and so the RSB factor is going to be too high. With that brush out of soil, remember that the RSB factor is equal to the reciprocal of the slope. So if instead of the slope being minus one half, if instead it's uh, minus uh, one third, a little bit less steep, the B factor in this case then would be the reciprocal of so three, and the larger the B factor, the more aggressive the production forecast, the more future production they would estimate. Not much we can do about it if we don't know what the bottom of the pressure is, except to recognize the production forecast is likely to be too high. And what in the long run, they're going to be disappointed. They're not going to produce that much oil and gas. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's a good idea. I'll try to do that. And I apologize on my end for the fact that we had problems seeing the slides, but that's that comes with technology. I think we all have learned to live with that. But anyhow, what you suggest is a good idea. If those of you in the audience have questions, uh, send them in on the chat box, and they'll be sent to me, and I'll try to respond as I can by email to whatever questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, John, very interesting your, your presentation. A great, great honor for us to hear you. And um, what well, will be we'll in touch. Okay, very good. Well, again, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.